Hello, welcome to the third night of the Ori Georgetown Technical College Addiction and Recovery Lecture Series. My name is Casey King, and I'll be your host for the evening. I'm a physics professor here at the college. I'm the creator and organizer for this event. I'm also a person in long-term recovery. We're glad you decided to spend some time with us tonight. In the first hour, you'll hear messages from four of the best recovery resources available here in the Myrtle Beach area. Then in the second hour, you'll hear actor and comedian, Rich Scheidner, who'll be telling his own addiction and recovery story. So sit back and relax, try to relate, don't compare. You don't have to leave the house for this one, you can relax. First, from Shoreline Behavioral Health and here to share her recovery testimonial, please welcome Whitney Roberts. Hi. I'm Whitney Roberts. I am a person in long-term recovery. I'm also a certified peer support specialist at Shoreline Behavioral Health Services in Conway, South Carolina. Um, it's, it's sort of funny because I, um, I was supposed to be celebrating seven years in recovery tonight, um, but I'm doing this instead, so it's, it's a win-win. Um, <laughs> My, um, my recovery journey started um, February 13th, 2015. I, um, I don't really want to touch too much on, you know, the throes of active addiction. Um, most of us know what those are. Um, I want to focus more um, tonight on what led, like what led me into recovery and the path I took and where I'm at now. So um, basically, you know, I was sick and tired, like most of us who are in recovery get. And, um, and I knew I have, um, I have family members who are in recovery. So um, I went and asked for help, you know. Um, our families know we have a problem usually before we know we have a problem. So um, I went to my stepdad and said, you know, you're right. I need help. What should I do? Where should I go? So um, that night, he took me to a 12-step a meeting, and that's where my recovery journey started, in a 12-step fellowship. Um, everybody has a different journey. Um, you find what fits for you and what works for you, and you stick with it, and that's what worked for me. Um, so, you know, it, it helped me because I was able to meet people um, and form relationships and bonds with people who understood me and related to me and showed me um, how to live a life in recovery. And, um, and, it, and it helps me now in the job I do as a peer support. I, um, I became a certified peer support specialist through um, Favor Grand Strand, which is now the Peer Connection. Um, and that was in 2000. 18 and um I got a job here at Shoreline shortly after um I started out working um in the emergency department one of our local hospitals as a peer support specialist and um clients would come into the emergency room with substance abuse problems and I would go into the room and talk to them about their substance use and see if they felt like they had a problem and most of the time they did and I would tell them the different paths they could take for recovery, you know, what worked best for them, whether it was they wanted to do detox or rehab or 12 step program or outpatient treatment um, at, you know, wherever, whatever suited them in their life at that time. Um, that's part of peer support, a peer support's job is to meet, you know, meet them where they are. So that's what, you know, that's what my goal was in the hospital. I recently um, have switched positions at Shoreline, and now I'm working at the agency um, as a peer support specialist, and I work with our um, clients that are on medicated assisted treatment um, and, you know, continue to meet them where they are and help them on their path of recovery, whatever that path may be. Um, I feel like, I feel like it's really, it's, it's, it benefits my recovery working with people who are new in recovery um hopefully just as much as i benefit them in their recovery um because we can learn from each other and um and i learn stuff every day um it helps my recovery 
grow. Um, and it's, it's, it's wild for me to think about it because if I, if I, seven years ago, if I thought I would be here talking <laughs> for this series as a Shoreline employee, I would have told you you were crazy. You know, I never would have thought, um, one, that I would be in recovery and two, that I would have this experience to share with everybody who's watching. Hopefully not that many because I'm kind of nervous, <laughs> but, um, it's just, you know, it's just crazy to think and, and how far I've come. Um, I don't always, I don't always think about that, you know, and I was, I was talking to some coworkers today and I was telling them how nervous I was about getting on here and speaking and sharing my recovery story. And they're like, but you talk every day, you, you tell your recovery story every day to, you know, clients and just people, you know, why are you nervous? And for some reason I am. <laughs> Um, but I do that. This is what I do all day long. You know, I just talk to the people that come here and, you know, share my recovery story and what I did and what worked for me and struggles I've had and how I've gotten past those struggles, you know, um, the, you know, for me and my recovery, the most important thing is just the connections and the network that I have formed in my recovery and the support system, um, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't do it by myself for sure. Um, if I was able to do it by myself, I probably would have gotten into recovery a whole lot sooner. Um, but, you know, everybody needs somebody to help them and be there for them. And so that's benefited me. You know, when I was when I was in active addiction, even though, you know, I had my family, I still felt alone, you know, and I still I had friends, but they weren't true friends, you know, they're what my mom calls fair weather friends, you know, and, and, um, and once I got into recovery, those friends were no longer around, you know, they didn't want to partake in the new lifestyle, um, that I wanted to partake in. And, um, and the relationships I had with my family, I had to rebuild a lot of those relationships because I had broken a lot of relationships. I'd broken a lot of trust, um, and that trust is a hard thing to rebuild, but it can be rebuilt, you know, and I've done that. Um, I think my whole family's watching tonight. So, hey, um, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, you, for me, I felt very alone in active addiction, um, which also caused me to want to stay in active addiction longer, caused me to stay in active addiction longer, that, that worthlessness and that, um, feeling less than and feeling alone and, and for me, basically self-medicating with substances to kill that pain that I felt constantly. Um, and then I, you know, I found this new way to live and realized, you know, that I needed to go through the pain, you know, I needed to feel the feelings to get through it and learn how, learn a new way to manage it. Um, and I try, I try to share those tools with the clients that I interact with on a daily basis. You know, we can only learn from our experience and sharing our experience with others. So that's what I, I try to do that on a daily basis. Um, and it's just, it really has um, helped my recovery grow having this job and having the opportunity to share with others what I have found. And it's just, you know, it makes me very grateful um, and it's sometimes very humbling <laughs> and a reminder that I could easily, I mean, just one decision can tear everything I've built back up. You know, I, you know, I see it. I see it every day. Um, one bad decision and the consequences that it can bring with, you know, with the people I interact with um, here at work and even the people I interact with in my in the 12 step program that I'm a, a member of. Um, and it's, it's sad. It, um, addiction is a horrible thing and it, it takes, it takes a lot of lives, um, out of this world. And a lot of people who know, who know recovery and make that one bad decision. And then some people who don't know recovery at all, you know, that haven't been told that there's hope that there's several different options you know, it's not just one way. If one way worked for, for everybody, I would be out of a job. <laughs> um, 
and and I try I try to to educate people and not just people who suffer with substance abuse disorder. You know, there's a huge stigma in the in the world with substance abuse disorder, and so that's another part of my job. I try to educate the you know people I come into contact with um, who don't suffer with what I suffer from. You know, who don't know. Um, what addiction is and how hard it is to um, get into recovery. We think, you know, it's just a decision. It's not, it's not a decision, you know, addiction is a, a disease. So I try to educate people that I come into contact with about that, you know, um, and sometimes it's hard, but <laughs> I try my best. Um, and I just try, I tell when I first started working at the hospital, I would have um, doctors and nurses and just different people come up to me and, and they say, well, what do you, what do you do here? Are you, are you selling something? And I'd say, yeah, I'm selling hope. You know, that was just the easiest way to explain, you know, what I was doing. And, um, and I, and I still try to do that just to show that there's hope and there's a different way and you can achieve it. And it's not, it's not as hard as you think it is, you know, it's hard work. It's work every day. It is hard work, but it's not impossible to do. Um, and I think that's all I have. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. <laughs> Thank you, Whitney. If anyone would like more information about Shoreline Behavioral Health, please use the contact information that you see displayed on the screen. To ask your questions. We appreciate Loretta being or Whitney being here. Next from Grand Strand Health and here to discuss the topic of aging and addiction, please welcome Loretta Bangs. I'm really glad to be here with you all. Um, to, uh, I'm not sure if my slides are coming up. Hopefully you see them. So what led me to this topic is I've been in the field of addictions for about 35 years, going on 36 years. And about 25 years ago, I started to notice that our clients were getting older. So I'm going to pull off the slides because I don't think they were coming up right. Um, but we started to notice about 25 years ago in the addictions agents I worked in that our clients were getting older. They were coming in 60, 65, 70 years old, and they weren't sticking with treatment. And we started to look at, you know, why is that? And what we started to hear was, I don't relate to these people. I'm in groups with younger people. They don't get it. I'm at a certain different point in my life now. And they just can't relate to a 40-year-old who's talking about the frustrations with work. So we started to think, you know, if we see a couple of these people, there's more out there. And as we researched it, we started to see there was a huge population of people that were not being treated because they were over the age of 60 and people weren't really identifying them. They weren't providing treatment for them. So what were the obstacles? The obstacles, the biggest obstacle we found was ourselves, that we didn't, um, people didn't know how to assess this. People didn't believe that somebody who was older would have a problem. The feeling was you get older, you slow down your drinking, your drug use, and this is not a problem anymore. And often when people are older and using, it gets written off as dementia. You know, it must be Alzheimer's, you know, with this happens. Um, I would hear a lot of people say, well, everybody gets dementia and everybody doesn't get dementia. So as we started to educate people, um, we also would hear from them. We, we'd be going out, we're talking to doctors and emergency rooms. And one of the things we found out is that if you don't know what to do with the problem, you're not going to ask about it. So a doctor is not going to ask about your drinking or your drug use if they don't know where to send you. So we love denial, right? So let's not ask the question. We don't have to deal with it. So these people were getting lost. What we know now in South Carolina, 18% um, of our population in the state is 65 or older. In Horry County, where we are, it's 25%. 
And the projection is that this is going to continue to rise, right? We have good health insurance now. People get to live longer. So we're going to see this number increase. So what does that mean for all of us in addictions and mental health? It means we need to be prepared to deal with this. So recognizing that the number is going to keep going up, recognizing that we have to look at our own biases about this. Nobody likes to think of their grandmother as being an addict or having a problem. So, you know, that's not the problem. It must be something else. Um, so we are our biggest obstacle. So how do we start to look at this? First, it's educating people. Um, but looking again, look at our own bias, educating ourselves, understanding that the people that are coming into later life now were the baby boomers. Baby boomers had a different experience than people who were in their 80s and 90s. Um, they're more open to treatment. They have more exposure to drugs other than alcohol. Um, there, we know that as you get older, your tolerance changes. So people start to, um, they may be using less. Oh, there we go. We may be using less um, because you need less to, to get high when you're older, right? So if you needed a case of beer to get a buzz when you're 40, you may only need a six pack when you're 60. And what we used to hear from families when we'd start asking about addiction, families would say, well, I know it's not their alcohol use because you know, they drink a lot less. So we've written, but when you go back and look at it, that might've been the problem. Um, so it's that understanding that the body is changing. They're dealing with later life issues, such as retirement, loss of people, loss of family members, uh, relocation. We live in an area that's like the retirement capital of the country here in Myrtle Beach. And I hear it every day on our inpatient unit. I moved in here. I thought life would be great, but my friends aren't around. My family's not around. I don't really know how to make friends, but you know what? If you got a happy hour or, you know, Joe down the street likes to, you know, crack a few beers and then we're finding here's our new uh, way of socializing. We're drinking. So we need to wrap our brains around. This is what we have to start addressing. Um, the differences that we see with this population yeah, we can go through the obstacles. We went through that. Um, the types of substances that we're that are being used are different. Right, right there. Um, as people get older, they use alcohol more than other drugs. However, we're starting to see a change in that because again, as the baby boomers are coming in, um, or the later baby boomers are coming in, we're seeing more opiates. Uh, more methamphetamine showing up in that population. Um, the way they use may be different. They're using more at home. They're not out. They're not showing up on the job because they've retired. They may not be, they're not showing up at the kids' schools and other things where younger addicts we might spot. They're using at home. They may be using in their communities um, with other people. Um, they're not always out in bars. So, um, we have to pay attention to that. The consequences, they may still have DWIs, but there's a lot of physical consequences. We hear a lot of, um, in their community, there's a problem. You know, the neighbors are upset that they're um, getting drunk and maybe getting loud and getting high and, and they're seeing things go on in their community. So the housing becomes an issue. You know, it's starting to hit there. Um, so some of these natural effects of aging result in that increased sensitivity to alcohol, change in tolerance. Um, same thing with other medications. This population, nine out of 10 are using some type of medications. So the combination of substance use and those medications can be disastrous. Um, they have chronic conditions. So if you have somebody who's already dealing with hypertension or diabetes, GI bleeding, depression, adding any substances we all know is just going to exacerbate that problem. So I keep bringing this back to this is why we need to address the problem. 
It's costing our hospitals millions and millions of dollars a year to treat the consequences of substance abuse in this population, right? We all know the younger population, a lot of emphasis is on that, but many times these people are coming into the emergency room with a broken hip. Well, maybe they fell because they were wasted or they're bleeding ulcer because the alcohol aggravated what was already there. So with this population, we're looking at alcohol being the most common, but the other drugs have to be considered. What we need to look at is the specific needs of the individual. Can they get to your program? If they're older, they have medical problems. Can they get to us? Um, do they understand you know, what the problem is that we're addressing? Are they living alone? Are they dealing with depression? Are they dealing with grief, which is so common in this population? We present materials in different formats. We have, and I've had these for years, large print big books, um, big book audio, because if somebody has vision problems or hearing problems, obviously they need more help in getting this. Age appropriate groups. On our inpatient program, when we have three or more people, 60 or older, we start splitting groups and they always breathe a sigh of relief. You know, these people can understand what I'm talking about. The 30 year old's a nice guy, but he doesn't get it. He doesn't get that I lost my wife or I gave up my job. It's really important also to engage caregivers and family. Who are the people that are gonna be supporting them? They need to understand too, the role of substances. This is not dementia. They may, there may be dementia happening somewhere, but let's rule it out for, get this out of their system first. Um, being aware of the increased sensitivity of the medications and the age and comfort level with discussing personal issues. That's for them, but uh, sometimes older people are not as comfortable. We also need to be very comfortable with uncomfortable topics like death and dying, right? There's nothing worse than somebody says, I'm 80 years old, I'm thinking about end of life issues and somebody shuts it down. And then lastly, being sensitive to how they view themselves. That cartoon was some people say, I'd rather be a baby boomer than a senior citizen. It's what it conjures up for them. And I'll tell you that 20 years ago, I started a senior specific program in another state. And it took the staff a month to come up with a name because people didn't like the name, especially our staff that was close to the 60. And, you know, so it's interesting. So we, I say to people, how do you want me to refer to you? Yeah. And then we go with that. So being very sensitive to what it's like for somebody in that age group or any age group, but not to dismiss them, not to minimize that this is a problem and not to write everything off to dementia or other medical problems. Okay, so I appreciate you listening to this tonight. And this is our number. We offer inpatient behavioral health as well as partial hospital and intensive outpatient. And feel free to call us if you need something. Thanks. Thank you, Loretta. If anyone would like more information about Grand Strand Health, please use the phone number that's shown uh, to ask your questions. Next, from Lighthouse Behavioral Health Hospital, and here to discuss their views on recovery are Bathsheba Sherman and Kathy Buell. Let's get you unmuted. The sheep I have to unmute. Sorry about that. Hi, my name is Bashiba Sherman. I work at the Lighthouse Behavioral Health Hospital um, in the relapse prevention program with individuals who are dealing with chemical dependency. And I'm Kathy Buell, and I work in the outpatient beacon. I'm the clinical director here, and I've been in this field for 34 years. And uh, I have my own personal recovery for, oh, excuse me, personal recovery for 34 years and in the field for 32. And one of the reasons that we're doing this is to talk about what recovery really is to us and why we do this work. Um, you know, I've been doing this a long time, and, and I wouldn't do it if it didn't work. I wouldn't do it if we didn't have some success. I wouldn't be here if we couldn't help. And I think that's really what I wanna say. Recovery is about change. It's probably one of the most magnanimous changes an individual is going to make from 
using substances on a daily or near daily basis to coming into being afforded the opportunity to put them down and say, I want a different way of life, or I don't know what's wrong with me, but something has to change. And so when we approach new patients or new clients and we say, you know, I think it's the substances, I think we've got to work on, you know, you learning how to live drug free. That's what we're talking about. And this change is phenomenal. Uh, change is doing things a different way, taking suggestions, learning that maybe my way isn't working and it's okay to have a change in your life. Change is changing one's thinking and learning how to process feelings differently, learning that feelings aren't the enemy. One of the things that we try to impart on our patients here is to learn to live with your feelings and use them as guides to help you understand where you are at and never to define yourself by your emotions, but to help you learn to use emotions to guide you in your daily life. And we wanna help people learn to take their behavior and learn to choose, to make decisions about behavior and how they wish to behave rather than react um, you know, to their other people in their environment. It's one of the things that addicts and alcoholics have a difficult time processing. So to us, learning this basic premise of what change is, is what we try to impart on our patients here. Recovery is about choice. Um, learning that the addict or the alcoholic did not choose to be addicted. Oftentimes, family members have a hard time understanding this disease as in um, the addiction as a disease. And so it's very important to understand that they grew this through a dependency of doing the same thing over and over. And now it has become their survival mechanism. Um, also learning to look at factors that impede your ability to stay in recovery and being able to in, identify those things that are triggers for relapse. Um, so choosing to have a goal plan, making sure that it's an action plan towards recovery. Oftentimes we may set goals, but we need to be able to set actions because it takes me doing something to get something out of it. And to work recovery is gonna require you to do the work. Also choosing to ask for help. Um, asking for help does not make you weak. It just simply says that I now realize that I've not been doing or living to the best of my ability. And it's gonna require me to reach out to the healthy people, the um, professionals and get the help that I need to start my recovery process. I don't have to know everything when it comes to recovery and the professionals and the healthy people will help me and give me good orderly direction towards working my recovery program. Also choosing the right people, the healthy people to be around. You want to choose people who are moving in a positive direction, the direction that you would like to go in your recovery. So when it comes to the point of asking for help, it won't be so hard to do so because they are already a part of my supportive network. And so I'm able to reach out to them when I find myself at a crossroad and I don't know what to do. Um, learning to stay in the moment. Oftentimes when we're working recovery, we have a hard time just focusing on the task at hand because of all the racing thoughts that are going on in our head, all the things that we have to be responsible for in our recovery and even in our addiction that now has troubled me because I have to maybe go do some time because of some of the choices that I made in active addiction. And so learning to stay in the moment gives you the strength to work this one day at a time. Recovery is about trust. It's one of the most difficult things I see for our patients to come in and, and trust this process of recovery. The difficulty with trust, they don't trust themselves. They don't trust their own choices that they've made. They don't trust the people that they've chose to be in their lives. They don't trust themselves. And so what we're asking them to do is trust this process. You know, the idea that if you walk into a 12-step meeting or you walk into a recovery group of any type or sort, that you can learn from another person that this works. This is what we did to recover. And if I can do this, perhaps you can do this. Take this suggestion, try this, take this risk and try this new way of life. 
uh, try doing what we do and maybe you'll benefit from what we've learned. Um, this is such a challenge for most people because they're used to doing things their own way or isolating at times. Uh, you know, Loretta brought up about with older people and, and, and sometimes with our senior citizens not being able to get out. It's hard for them to ask for help, to ask for rides. It's hard for our populations to trust that people will actually show up if they say they're going to help them. Uh, it's hard for them to believe that therapists understand what they're, what they're asking and, and what they're going through or other people in the group. There's a sense of terminal unique, uniqueness with a lot of addicts that uh, no one understands them. And what we're saying is that, you know, we've got to trust this process that there are people who will understand you, who will relate to you, who will identify with you, with whom you will identify with, and they can help you. It's learning to respect oneself, to build self-worth and self-confidence, and learning to trust ourselves to pick the right people as part of our recovery in our lives. It's learning to act in accord with the principles of recovery, honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness, and to do whatever is necessary to stay clean and sober each day. And the idea that if one remains free from substances and works at change, that they will be better able to handle life on life's terms. One of the most difficult things I think in recovery is, is learning to live on life's terms. You know, learning the difference between my, my own personal active addiction when I thought everything happened to me and life was happening to me versus my recovery experience, which is life happens. And I can learn to cope with life on life's terms. Recovery is about responsibility. Learning to take responsibility for our words, for our feelings and our actions, not projecting blame on others, beginning to really understand that I made a choice, there was choices to make, and yeah, I didn't make the right choice. But as I work recovery, I gained um, some endurance um, to stand the course. Um, I gained some maturity to be able to stand on my own to be along with other individuals that I deem as part of my network and part of my system and I work recovery. Um, learning to take responsibility for my past mistakes, understanding that everybody plays a part in the situation that has caused your demise when it comes to recovery and being an active addiction. Also learning that you know, I, I don't always have to know all the answers. Taking responsibility um, for our lives also gives us an opportunity to choose the right direction and me choosing that right direction. I can be elated. I can be happy to know that I did something on my own. And that motivates me to continue to work recovery, to stay motivated, and to continue to do those things that is necessary for me to succeed. And then lastly, re recovery is hope. And one of the things that Whitney had referred to was the hope of recovery. It's the hope in gaining that understanding that there is a better way to live than what we've been living before with drugs and alcohol. Uh, the hope that we see in other people who have made this transition, that gives you the opportunity to see that this works. And there is hope to be afforded the freedom to make better choices and find peace and joy each living, breathing day and to recognize that we only have to live a day at a time. To me, that was a marvel, uh, you know, just an amazing understanding that we just have to figure out how do I stay clean and sober today and live my life to the best of my ability and learn the most important aspect for me to recovery is gratitude and gratitude for all of it, for the pain, for the sorrow, for the struggle and the change. Gratitude becomes the adjective, the noun and the verb. It is present in a feeling as well as actions. To know gratitude is to know that it affords us true humility, perspective, and the ability to live compassionately, to be able to pay loving kindness forward. As professionals in the field, we have been given the opportunity to see the change in other people, to see the miracle of a person who comes in broken and in despair, wanting change and not often even knowing what's wrong with them. Addicts and alcoholics who at first hold on so desperately to their drugs, not wanting to give it up, not wa and wanting to believe that it's the only thing worth living for, and then learning to let go, to transcend the addiction, and when given a glimpse of recovery, grab hold and move forward. 
Often this process takes time and sometimes many attempts, but the fact that they return and try again is what keeps us doing this work. You know, it is the, the, the addict who comes back and says, you know, I, I wasn't able to do it, but I'm back again, can you help me? And we're always here to say, yes, of course, of course we can. Uh, there is no pay or benefit greater than seeing the miracle of recovery. When the individual sees the hope and joy that is possible and is working a program of recovery in their lives. Recovery is the process by which we re-enter and re-establish ourselves with the human race. It will give us the ability to be one amongst others and to be harmonious with others, to care for our brothers and sisters in life, and to remember that we walk alongside all others by learning and living the slogan, there, but, but for the, the grace, grace of God, God go I. Thank you very much. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Bathsheba and Kathy. If anyone would like more information about Lighthouse Behavioral Health Hospital, please use the email address that's displayed to ask your questions. Next up from the Peer Connection of Conway, formerly known as Faber Grandstrand, and here to tell her own personal story of addiction and recovery, please welcome Nicole Chris. Thanks, Casey. <clears throat> um, so first and foremost, I want to say that I am a woman who has experienced continuous successful recovery from substance use disorder since February 20th, 2014. So like Whitney, I'm getting ready to come up on an anniversary. Um, my anniversary is eight years in recovery. Um, and for me, that's, that's a huge accomplishment. Um, and what my, the important thing to know about what led me into recovery was that um, I wasn't taught or I didn't learn, let me put it that way. I didn't learn some of the skills that others learn throughout their, their childhood in how to, um, how to cope with life, how to have effective and healthy coping mechanisms. Um, I also didn't, I didn't really have good self-esteem. I didn't have any self-worth. I didn't think that um, I had any value. And because of all of those things, I put myself in positions that, um, that were not good. And I, I used substances to, to escape, to escape, to be able to just cope with life and to just numb myself. And during my life, I, um, I drank more than probably the average person. However, I was able to gain a career. Um, I had all of the normal things. Like I had a house, I had a husband, I had kids. I, you know, did, did all of those things, but I never felt truly content and happy. Um, but my life was manageable. And then I had uh, a, a disc in my back herniate and it herniated into my sciatic nerve and caused drop foot. I couldn't walk. Um, I ended up being taken in to have surgery fairly quickly. And it was a, a started out as a small surgery. It was a micro discectomy and that was supposed to solve my problem. Um, however, it didn't. And I was still living in chronic pain. I was having a lot of trouble walking. Uh, I went to physical therapy and the physical therapist was almost to the point to recommend that I would have to walk with a walker for the rest of my life. And this is, I'm 30, I was 35 around, around 35 at that time. And that was a shock for, for me. And, uh, and it totally had an impact on my, on me that I didn't even expect, which was that I had to give up my career. I couldn't, um, I couldn't do what I did for a living and what I did to have my stable home and all of the things. And because of that, I had to take my kids out of the school system that they were in. We lost our house. Um, I ha we had to move into a not so nice place. 
And I was, I remember laying there and just thinking that the best years of my life were behind me. And in your mid thirties, that's a pretty awful way to feel for me. It was anyway, I spent four years doing essentially nothing but laying in bed. Um, and this is from someone who was very physically active through all of my life. I, I played sports, um, did all of that. I took my kids to sports. Um, and here I am now spending four years in bed. And uh, the day that was the pinnacle for me was I was laying in bed. Um, I was at that time, I was on a high amount of opioid pain medication, most of which was prescribed to me. And they had also added uh, benzodiazepines <clears throat> to my um, medical care. And what benzos are, for those of you who don't know, are some form of Xanax. And uh, that was actually the Xanax or the benzos were the things that really that I really liked because for me, the, what, the way I referred to them was that they were like alcohol, alcohol in, on steroids in a pill without the hangover. And um, when you combine benzos and opioid pain medication, it can have a, a really big impact on you. That's why today most um, physicians don't like to do that. They didn't know that back then. And when I was prescribed uh, the benzos, I also had no idea how dangerous they were. I was not given education. I, I knew that opioid pain medications could be could be addictive, um, but I had no idea what the benzos could do to me. I had no idea how addictive they were. I had no idea the danger um, that I would be that I could be facing if I were to stop them cold turkey after being on them for any period of time. Um, yeah, so, uh, at the end, I was laying in bed one day and my son's school called and told me that he was at school vomiting and someone needed to come pick him up. And we lived, it was about a 30 minute drive from our house to, to his school. And I didn't have enough medication in my system to feel like I could function at all. So... I'm laying in bed. I have the, the, all of the symptoms that you have when you don't have the amount of medication you need in your system to feel healthy. I, um, was sweating. I, you know, my legs were all cramped up. Um, my stomach was upset and I just couldn't function. So there was no way I could get out of bed and go drive 30 minutes to pick my kid up and then drive home. Um, so I had to call somebody who, it didn't make me happy to call them and ask them to go get my kid from school. And it was that time that I, that I had it. I decided in my head that my kids would be better off with me dead than living like this as their mother. Um, another just awful feeling. So, um, so I had to grapple with that for a little bit and, um, at that time, uh, I also was married to someone who was abusing pills as well. And my older son um, was in active addiction. He was smoking um, cannabis a lot and he had dropped out of school. So it was my household was a mess. And my younger son was the only one that, you know, he was young. So, um, but he was suffering too. And uh, I got to this point where, you know, I, I didn't think that I was doing anything good for my kids. And uh, I couldn't, I didn't have the courage to do what it took to kill myself. I just didn't. Um, so I decided that if I could, if I wasn't going to kill myself, I couldn't continue living the way I was. I couldn't continue doing this to my kids. Um, I needed to do something. So I was living in Maryland at the time. Um, and fortunately I had health insurance and everything. So I went to the hospital and asked for help. 
And in Maryland at that time, you could walk into the emergency room and they would work with you to help you get linked into whatever treatment that you needed. And they gave me an option whether I wanted to go and be admitted um, to the psych unit or if I wanted to go home, they would give me enough medication to stabilize me until I could get into treatment. And I went to treatment and, um, and I was so broken. Um, I was living in Maryland. I went to treatment in Pennsylvania. It was in February, uh, a blizzard was coming and I didn't even take, think to take a coat with me to treatment. And the treatment center that I went to was, had multiple buildings. So you had to walk in and out, in and out. And um, I had to walk in and out with a blizzard with no coat during treatment. And I, I never want to forget how I felt while I was there because that is where my recovery began. And that is the most pain I've ever been in both physically and emotionally in my entire life. And I've been through some stuff. I've been abused in every which way you could think of. Um, you know, I've been through a lot of stuff. So after I got out of treatment, I did what they told me to do. And, um, and my recovery journey started. And like I said, before I got into recovery, I really didn't have any, any real self-worth. Um, I didn't think that I had a lot of potential. I thought that, you know, my best, my best years were behind me. And, uh, and I'm so glad that, that I didn't give into that because when I got into recovery, I started meeting people like um, like Whitney talked, Whitney talked about, I, I started to meet people who became real friends. They weren't the fair weather friends. They were the friends that these are the people that I can call when I'm at my darkest moment and they're going to show up for me. Um, and they're going to show up for me unconditionally. And they're going to show me unconditional love, which is a, a concept that I never really understood until I got into recovery. And uh, I started my recovery journey in Maryland and I had always had a dream of moving to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. I had been down here on vacation a few times and my, I never had the courage to do it. Um, things never lined up right. So about two years into my recovery journey, things lined up properly. And I was like, I'm going to do it. Um, I'm going to do something for me. And, and I did. And, uh, and that was, you know, that was a really good decision for me because it gave me an opportunity to come down here and, uh, and find myself and start over again. Um, another decision that I made when I started in my recovery journey was, uh, getting my education. Now I had mentioned that I had a career and all the things, um, but I, I worked in the medical field and I worked my way up in medical office administration. And I worked around a bunch of people who had a lot of education. And I always felt that I was lacking because I didn't have an education. When I got into recovery, I still had the chronic pain because this, I ended up having two surgeries on my back. And I do have permanent nerve damage in my sciatic nerve, which does affect how my foot works and sometimes how my leg works. And, uh, I couldn't go back to the career that I had. So I ended up on disability. And during that process, um, I knew that I didn't want to just do nothing. Right. So I decided that I was going to chase my goal of getting an education. I didn't know what I was going to be educated in. I didn't have any particular direction. I just decided to go back to school. Now, mind you, I spent 20 years trying to get my associate's degree. Um, I would start and stop, start and stop, start and stop. And uh, when I got into recovery, I, I made this goal and I was like, I'm just going to go back and at least finish my associate's degree. And I did that. Um, I did that fairly quickly. I think I had that within eight months of being in recovery because I didn't have much, much further to go, you know, because I had been trying for 20, 20 years. So I did get a couple of credits. Um, 
And then I had a bunch of credits in that process in English. So I decided, well, I'm going to go get my bachelor's degree and I might as well just do it in English because I've already got a bunch of education in that. So I didn't like make a deliberate decision or anything. It was just, um, I just had it. So I, so that's what I chose. And when I got my bachelor's degree, um, I, I thought I would be an English teacher and that really didn't work out well because I went and volunteered in a school with some high school kids and I, they worked my nerves and I didn't have the patience and tolerance for it. And I decided rather than going to jail for pinning some little high school kid up against the wall, that I might want to reconsider my career goals. Since I had this experience with recovery, I decided that why don't I look into um, something around substance use? So I went and got my master's degree in addiction studies. Um, and in that time, I also was introduced to a concept called peer support and this organization called Favor. I got trained to train people on how to become peer support specialists. And I learned how to be one myself. And that's been a really cool journey because I've gotten to train people like Whitney and others in our community on how to change their career and, and do something helping other people with substance use disorder. And it's that's been a really, really neat experience. And then what we do here at, um, at the Peer Connection is just provide peer support, peer-led support services to the community. We do preventative stuff like HIV, H hepatitis testing. We do one-on-one -on -one peer support. We do all recovery meetings. So we, I get to work with a lot of different people and a lot of different organizations in the community, all with the intention of just helping our community find recovery and sustain their recovery um, and just help people on their journey of wellness, whatever that means to them. In the process of my education, after I got my master's degree, you know, I had this goal in my head, right? When I, when I got into recovery, I was going to get my education. Um, so I got my master's degree and, and I sat on that for a little bit and I decided I started this, I'm going to finish it and I'm going to take it as far as I can. So I went back to get my doctorate degree. Um, I am, I have my capstone written and it's almost ready to go to the Dean for approval. So I'm hoping in the next few weeks, I will be finished my educational journey and I will actually be a doctor. Um, this is from someone who eight and a half, eight, eight years ago wanted to be dead because I didn't think that my kids deserved a mother like me alive. Um, that's what recovery has done for me. And it's enabled me to work in a community in which I love and live and give back. Um, and I can't think of a more rewarding life than the one that I have today. I know that a lot of times for those of us who are in recovery, we hear that term a life beyond our wildest dreams. And I heard that when I first got into recovery and I thought these people are full of it. Um, but I am here to say that I couldn't, I couldn't even imagine. This is not even a life that I could have dreamt because I didn't know the things that I'm doing today even existed. And, um, and I just, I just thank Casey for the opportunity to come on here and talk and represent our organization and, um, and share my journey of recovery with you all wonderful people. Thanks, Nicole. Such a powerful message. If anyone would like more information about the Peer Connection in Conway, contact information is displayed on the screen. Thanks again to Nicole. Thanks to Shoreline Behavioral Health, Grand Strand Health, Lighthouse Behavioral Health Hospital, and the Peer Connection of Conway, all of whom make this event possible every year. And we look forward to working with you in the future. Really appreciate your support. 
We're going to take a five minute break, so don't sign off just yet. We'll be back to hear from actor and comedian Rich Scheidner. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the HGTC Addiction and Recovery Lecture Series. My name is Casey King. Rich Scheidner has made appearances on Late Night with David Letterman, The Tonight Show, Married with Children, Designing Women, and Roxanne. Rich was able to translate this modest success on TV into an obscure film career, appearing in Steve Martin's Roxanne and Eddie Murphy's Beverly Hills Cop 2 before moving on to minor roles and even smaller, smaller pictures. Rich is currently performing in venues across America to small mask socially distanced audiences. He's given up any dreams of stardom for the satisfaction of not being an aging Uber driver, which brings him to here, here to us tonight. So please welcome from Asheville, North Carolina, Rich Scheidner. Thank you, Casey. I love that you read it verbatim. I love that. Uh, my name is Rich. I'm an alcoholic, drug addict, uh, eligible for any sort of addiction program you got out there. And um, I've been sober and clean since May 11th, 1985. We'll get to that. My story is uh, I, my story is my story. I um, I grew up in a small town in New Jersey. Uh, my dad was an alcoholic. He uh, had a lot of anger, a lot of anger, and um, you know when he's drinking, sometimes uh, he went crazy. Um, my earliest memory is me, like three years old, um, trying to get away from him underneath the kitchen table, and my mom trying to pull him off me. Now. You know what a three-year-old can do to deserve that you can you can't you know there's nothing really <laughs> but that's what happened and that's that's how i grew up and that's what i felt i had panic attacks from the age of about eight or nine um i didn't know what they were i couldn't breathe i'd lay in bed at night not able to breathe uh you know i found out later through a lot of uh help professional help that i i suffered from um panic attacks from fear i had so much fear as a kid, and I also had the feeling of, of being pulled out of my own body, which I later found out was a sign of dissociative disorder. The feelings were just too much for me, and I couldn't couldn't deal with, them, couldn't cope with them. Now, my friends who I grew up with will tell you they wouldn't have seen any of that because I wasn't going to let anybody see any of that. I had nobody to talk to, and um, I was so frightened, uh, and um, that my way of I remember uh hearing somebody say once if you're being run out of town get up front and act like you're leading the parade and that's how i lived my early life that i would act as if i was totally fearless i would do the craziest things i mean as kids we'd climb up trees and little small trees and somebody would chop them down you'd ride the tree to the ground i never backed down from anything never backed down from a fight um it was all you know that out there in public and then go home at night and and have a panic attack and and um, and dread and dread. I had a lot of dread. And then 12 years old, a friend of mine um, introduced me to a wonderful world of alcohol. I mean, I was around it a lot. My parents, uh, my mom didn't drink, but my dad was was drunk. And when he was happy is when he was drunk. Now, of course, on the other side of it, he would go violent too. But when he was laughing and uh, I saw, I noticed he was drinking. And so I knew there was something happening with that. So my friend and I and a couple other friends, five five kids, you know, camped outside, you know, in the small town, camped outside summer night, summer of 1965, if you really want to look at this as history. I know I might as well say 1865 to some people, but it was 1965. I know because the transistor radio was playing the Rolling Stones Satisfaction. And I drank my first drink, which was grain alcohol. It was produced by DuPont Chemical Company. My friend's older brother worked there as a chemist and he got us a bottle of 100% pure alcohol that we mixed with lemonade. And it did for me from the beginning what I've heard so many other alcoholics say. Immediately, I got relief. My fears disappeared. My self-consciousness disappeared. I felt funny. I felt completely fearless, which is all I really wanted. And uh, and and I was the you know I was the guy who was leading everything and and um, I woke up in the morning covered in vomit 
and couldn't wait to do it again. I mean, it was not like, oh, well, I, I, that was pretty rough. I don't know. You know, I didn't care. The, I have a younger brother who, um, he's not an alcoholic. And he, once we were talking about it, and he, he'll he have a half a beer. I mean, I've, I've sat with him and watched him walk away from a half a beer, which to me is it's sacrilegious. You know? And uh, and he said, you know, Rich, I, I can't. I couldn't take the hangovers. I, he said, I had two hangovers. I swear I'd never do that again. And to me, it was just like the cost of doing business. You just factor that in. It didn't even, didn't care that, that every time the next morning I'm, I'm throwing up to the point of dry heaving and praying to a God that I didn't believe in to help me, you know, that I was, I remember once I was so wrung out that I was in a bathroom and there was a, an ironing board that would come down in the bathroom. I guess it was designed to come down and save space. And I, I was throwing up and this thing came down and almost like a guillotine smacked my head and trapped me. I was so weak it trapped me over top the toilet bowl. And I'm calling for help. I'm in there calling for help. I was so weak. It didn't matter. I just, I'd do it again, do it again. And when I couldn't get alcohol, I did other things. Back in uh, my day, again, this could be a, a chemical history lesson for some people. They used to sell cough medicine, Robitussin, with codeine in it over the counter, which means you didn't have to have a prescription. You just walk up and buy a bottle of Robitussin with codeine. And I would order it like a Lenny Bruce routine, who's an old comic. And this is a, you know, he would, I would walk into a drugstore, the local drugstore, and I'd say, I'd give me a couple pencils and a notebook and 14 bottles of Robitussin. I never got the concept of enough when it came to alcohol and drugs. I had a stash. I always had a stash. When I was a kid, I hid um, my friend of mine's um, dad and him uh, made moonshine. And I used to take bottles that my dad Seagram seven whiskey bottles and they'd fill it up with moonshine. And I'd stash them in my basement uh, up in the, in the little rafters in the top of the base. I stashed them around the basement. Uh, I, I, that just started it. I was always a guy with stash, you know, and um, it's so funny. I mean, I, I, I think back, I mean, even if I couldn't get alcohol, we used to do this thing called knockout. We called knockout. We go down and play baseball, little league, and um, everybody's warming up and I'm doing this thing where you, you, it's just hyperventilation, really. You would breathe deeply real fast a bunch of times and someone would be behind you and grab you around the chest and squeeze hard while you held your breath. And you'd literally just pass out from lack of oxygen. And uh, I would do that rather than play baseball. <laughs> you know, I'd be like, the game's starting. I'm like, one more time. Give me one more time. So no matter what it was, you know, right from the beginning, I was on it. And, um, you know, my, my report cards when I was young would say, uh, you know, in, in grade school, they'd say, Richie's not living up to his potential. Richie's not living up to his potential. By the time I got to high school, they were, yeah, he's pretty much where he is. <laughs> he's, he's a C and D guy. I guess that's where he is. And, uh, but I tested well. That's what it was. I just would test well and get by. And um, I just, I just bowled my way through high school. Uh, uh, lots of fights, lots of trouble. Um, I, I remember I was voted a, a, a student council president and the very next day got into a fist fight with a guy in an assembly right in front of the whole school. It just no, I had no impulse control in terms of anger. And it's just fear. I'm not bragging like I was tough. I'm not tough. Definitely wasn't tough, but I was so fear ridden. I could not, you know, I had a fight and flight. You know, I remember once, getting a fight with a guy and he hit me a bunch of times and I kept, it was almost like a scene from a movie. I kept coming back. And my thought was afterwards, if you can't hit me harder than my dad did, don't bother. I mean, it was just that, that sort of, it wasn't serving me well. None of this stuff was making me more thoughtful and considerate. I didn't, I didn't have that. I didn't have that. I had a need to get, um, out of the position I was in, in terms of my men mentality. I needed to change my perspective constantly. I, I never woke up thinking it's gonna be a great day and can't wait to get out there and everybody's gonna be happy to see me. I never woke up like that. 
I woke up and had to struggle out of bed every morning at school. I had the responsibility to get my brothers and sisters going because my dad was hung over in his own problem. My mom had a lot of, you know, moving parts she had to keep going in terms of the family. And I was struggling myself. And um, when I got to college, it was really on. My, my main problem early on was uh, I was late getting my driver's license because I was, I graduated young. And um, when I got my driver's license, it became really apparent I had a problem. I crashed a lot of cars fast. I was lucky I never hurt anybody else. I just had some broken bones myself, but I was a blackout drunk driver. I mean, I remember waking up talking to police officers. I mean, not knowing that I was in a crash until I came out of the blackout. And it's not, it's not an easy thing. You're kind of like, well, all of a sudden, I know you're just talking to somebody, but that guy's gone and I'm here now. So if you can just catch me up to where we are in this process you know, of me lying to you about what's going on. I mean, I constantly got out, getting out of trouble only because of the drunk driving ethos back then was so lax. And so, you know, I mean, literally I got pulled over before by police officers. You're drunk, son. Can you make it home? Can you get home? Yeah, okay, go straight home. Don't drink anymore. They take the alcohol from me and just go, don't, don't go to any other place. Just go straight home and you'll be okay. You know, we won't bother you. I mean, and if you got in a crash and it was you, just you, they were just sort of like, well, you've, I guess their mentality was you've, you've been punished enough by the crash and the broken bone, so we're not going to pile on with a drunk driving charge. That's the only way I got out of drunk driving charges when I was young. And I then found uh, a savior to that which was uh, methamphetamines uh, in the form of uh, pills back then. They were black, they're called black beauties, little black pills, little white pills had a cross in them or Christmas trees, little red and green capsules. They were all forms of speed. And once I found those, then I was no longer a blackout drunk. Now the drunk driving, I just became a wide awake drunk driver, which means I still get in a car crash, but I could see the crash coming and believe me, in retrospect, that's a decided advantage over a blackout drunk. It's just, at least I, I knew where, you know, I, some days I woke up and saw my car and I'm like, what happened? I mean, the whole, one time I woke up, looked out the bedroom window and went, oh, my car's okay and it's here. And then I come outside and the entire passenger side is raked off. I mean, just, I run down somebody's car or hit something and tore up the car and I had no idea, no memory of it. So once I found the methamphetamines, uh, it, that was in its own problem. And, you know, every line that I said I wouldn't cross, I kept crossing. Every line. I'm not going to do this, and I did that. I'm not going to, you know, I got to college, it got even worse. I mean, weed was just something, I mean, I that, that was, I probably, you know, during that period of uh, the late teens when I smoked weed, and again, this is, can't even compare it to the weed today, which is, you know, uh, I have a cousin who's a grower for, for a a big motorcycle gang. He's been a marijuana grower. He was. He's retired now, but he was a marijuana grower for a big motorcycle gang. And he said the stuff that we smoked back in the in the 70s, late 60s and 70s, is about 5%, 6% THC. And this stuff today is closer to 50. So it's, you can't even compare the intensity. I mean, uh, it's just not even close. But I did smoke it and smoked it a lot, and it was a problem because I got very withdrawn. I got very much in my head. I was very self-conscious, always self-conscious. I never felt, and this is odd, and people will tell you that well, he was a very popular guy, and I was. I hung out with a lot of different groups, but I never hung out too long with any one group because I was afraid you'd get to know who I really was. And once you saw me for who I really was, you would reject me. So I was very good at floating in, mimicking what you were doing, and floating out. That was looking back, that was probably my greatest skill in terms of I could read people. And I think a lot of adult children of alcoholics are good at reading people, reading situations. We have to to survive in the house. I had to be able to tell when my dad was about ready to explode so I could move back out of fist range. These are these are skills that I had that I didn't realize that I had and certainly wasn't putting them on any kind of resumes. You know, The ability to detect a fight coming is uh, one of his leading skills. Uh, that and walking away from a car crash. These are the two things. If you're looking for that in an employee, this young man here is the guy for you. So I didn't, I didn't have any of that. And I, 
I had a, um, a feeling that I was always on the outside. Even when I was around people who were, by definition, my best friends, I never felt like I knew exactly what was going on with them or anybody else, that they had something else. They had a connection. They had some understanding that I did not have. And only when I was drinking or when I was high, I loved anything. I didn't care. I mean, literally, a lot of times, somebody would hand me something, I would take it. And I remember a friend of mine said, you didn't even ask what that was. It's like, I didn't care what it was. It was taking me some other place than where I was at that moment. That's all I knew. And, you know, the, I remember, these are, these are random stories and all, but uh, the first time I went, and it was out in Colorado, and, and, and uh, I hooked up with some people, and one of them was a Native American. We were going to do peyote. And it was going to be a very spiritual event. And I insisted we bring along tequila. I mean, it's not enough for me to do be, you know, tripping on psilocybin. I've got to have tequila too. I cannot, nothing's enough. Nothing, I, I'm, I'm worried, I'm worried that, that I'll stagnate, that I'll, that I'll get dropped down into that place that I fear of going back to, which is the, the panic attack, depression. I thought, I never realized, uh, uh, my college girlfriend sent me, and I was, I guess I was a letter writer. She sent me a box a couple of years ago of all of the letters I wrote to her during college. And I, you know, I expected to see the word beer drunk a lot. That's what I expected to see. You know, I couldn't believe how many times I saw the word depression. I didn't even know I knew the word depression at the age of 18 or 19. And I'm depressed. I'm coming out of a depression. I'm depressed. I mean, these letters are riddled with it. And that was my mental state. I mean, I, it was not a, I, there was no, idea of getting sober the, the ethic that i grew up with was you do work and then it's five o'clock it's miller time it's 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 you do whatever you want as long as you've done your work as long as you've done your work um then okay and in college i i didn't do my work I, I cheated a lot i i spent you know somebody once said you know if you ever spent the time studying that you did preparing your cheat sheets you would have learned just as well, but I didn't. I didn't have any confidence in doing it, it the right way. I didn't. I didn't. You know, my my thing was built around. You know, I'd start off with beer. I'd, I'd have some beer, you know, to you know, to think about what I was going to do. Then I'd do do some speed to get excited about what I was going to do, and then I'd smoke some weed and forget what I was going to do. So I was in this like suit, this sort of loop, 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 loop. Beer, speed, weed, beer, speed, weed. And um, I, I, I had some instincts that, that did save me, help me. I was hooked up with some guys and they were all shooting speed. And this is back in the early 70s. All these guys got um, hepatitis C later. That was the problem then. This was pre-AIDS. And, uh, but I didn't know. I just knew that I didn't want any one of these guys approaching my arm with a needle. <laughs> None of them looked competent. That's all I knew. It was like, you know, you're not, none of you guys are sticking to me with anything, right? And I had no idea about, it wasn't any kind of hygiene thing. Now, now, now 10 years later, uh, uh, you know, my friends and I are, are shooting cocaine. So I certainly crossed that line. It wasn't a fear of needles. It was like, my nose is burnt out. I have to ingest cocaine another way. Give me the needle. I'll do it. And so it was always, there was, it was, I was, I was caught. I knew I was an alcoholic before I knew I was an alcoholic. I took a job. I was in law school. I got into law school. I know it's hard to believe when I'm telling you this story. You go, what? He's cheating. He's got, he's got bad report cards in school. <laughs> I told you, I, I, I tested well and I, I got into a law school that wasn't accredited. It wasn't, it wasn't a top tier law school. It was, it was in Washington, D.C. It was the International School of Law and Lawnmower Repair. So they, they knew you, good chance you weren't going to pass the bar, so they gave you a skill of fixing in lawnmower engines or something. No, I'm just joking. The fact is, I went to the school. It did become accredited later, George Mason University. But when I was in the school, the first year I was in the school, I was so absolutely, I have to prove that I can do this. I had to prove I could do this. I did not drink and did not do drugs for a year. I totally white-knuckled it and did very well could not hold the line. I, could, I mean, I got so much feedback. People, 
I know, look at me now. I mean, I come to law school and people were dressed up for success. People were wearing suits to law school classes. And I'd come with painter bib overalls, you know, a, a, a Jackson Brown t-shirt and long hair. And they all thought I was just a goof idiot, but I was studying obsessively. I mean, that's all I did. And when the grades came out and they looked at I was third in the class, everybody was like, join my study group, come join my study group. Well, I was just, I'd had it. I didn't like them. I didn't like me. And I found a, another career, it, just quite accidentally. A friend of mine says, you're funny, let's go in. And he took me down to a coffee house and I started doing stand-up comedy. Well, this fit me perfectly. First of all, a brief amount of time in front of people, putting on a show, putting on a facade, acting as if somebody with one purpose to make them laugh. I'm talking, they're listening. I got the control with the microphone. This fit me. And for just an hour a day, I could not, I was not, I knew I was not going to be able to show up at a job, you know, eight to five, eight to seven. I was not going to be able to do that because, you know, even when I was doing the stand-up comedy, you know, I was working in bars, which had lots of alcohol and other drugs available. I was right. It was perfect for me. Perfect. And so I, I left the law. Law school, I, I, I eventually got my degree by, by a freakish thing. I know this is all sounds weird, but I, and, I, and I'll tell you, the this, this side, you know, one of my friends in law school, she um, talked to this woman who was doing a national prison project in Washington, D.C., and they needed somebody to go interview prisoners. Now, see, it's an adrenaline rush for me to go into a prison and interview somebody who's in there for murder. That's mostly what they were doing was, was, was finding out people who had had their Eighth Amendment is violated by inadequate counsel. Their, their lawyer showed up drunk, didn't even talk to him before the trial, that sort of thing. And so to me, it was just an adrenaline rush. And then the woman who was running it got me uh, a credit at the university, law, at the law school for the volunteer work I did. I didn't know that she did that. So when I thought I left law school early, I actually um, got my degree and they sent it to my parents. <laughs> I was up in New York doing comedy and again, this fit me perfectly was traveling moving from town to town it hid my addictions very easily i'd come into a new town i'd meet of course the people at the bar and the, and um back in the in the early 80s stand-up comedy was exploding and we were treated like rock stars so all the hipsters would show out and all the drug dealers would show out and the first night you'd had your choice of who you're going to hang out with and i would act like oh geez cocaine i haven't done that in a long time of course i'd just been doing it the week before at the city before constantly so i could hide it i could hide my addiction more easily only working an hour a night Whew. <laughs> you know it's the same sort of thing that I, I i i like i said i knew i could not drink and do drugs before i went on i just knew i could not do that because once i started i couldn't stop and and i knew that i and i really wanted to do well in this i loved the laughter it it soothed my soul. It felt like pure uncut approval, which I, that's all I was begging for. And I felt like connected to people in a way I couldn't feel connected to them. And um, I had I had that experience of, of, of not doing it, not doing it before, you know, before I went on stage. But I, I slipped on that just like every other thing. I remember once I You know, I, I pull all nighters studying in, in college, which again, gave me an excuse to do speed. And uh, of course, one time I, I was studying and somebody said, we study with pot. If you, this is where I was getting this advice from, the geniuses I was getting advice from is hilarious. An upperclassman said, look, you know, study with pot. You know, you'll read slower, but it really, it, it, the, the weed pulls it in and it, it's, it prints it in your brain, you know, you do it with a pot, you know, with a pot, Re study with a pot. I got to tell the story. So, so of course I did it and I go into the class the next day. I don't remember anything. He said, you did get a high before you went in, to, you went in to, to take the test, right? I said, what? well, you have to do the drug when you go in to take the test. Then you have to do the drug then. So, of course, the next test I take, I do the same thing. I smoke the weed that I'm reading it the night before studying. And the next day I smoke weed before I go into the test. Of course, I get three answers done out of 50. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm really considering three questions. Really, I'm spending a lot of time on three questions. So the next time he says, oh, yeah, what's your chemical thing? I don't know why I'm still listening to this guy's advice. is hilarious to me at this point. 
obviously he was probably my drug dealer in the school. I have no idea. But he says, oh, well, you're a, your chemical basis is different, whatever BS he had at the time. You need to do speed, which again, he's speaking to the, you know, he's preaching to the choir now. As soon as he mentioned speed to me, I'm all over it. You know, I knew I couldn't get drunk and do it, but I, the speed sounds like, he says, yeah, do the speed, uh, study on the speed, and the next day, take the test on speed. It's the same principle, just a different drug. Your, your biochemistry, blah, 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 blah. So, of course, the next time I take a test, I stay up all night, you know, reading on speed. The next day, I take some more speed, went to take the test, and I am, uh, I am finished 50 questions in about three minutes. <laughs> so, I've had every experience you're going to have. And so when I get into doing stand-up comedy, I am, jeez, uh, you know, I am so obsessed with doing well in this. It's, and again, it's almost like my first year of law school, you know, where I, I, I go, I'm going to just, I'm not going to get high before I go on. I know that won't work for me. You know? And of course, I've slipped up in every possible way you could do it, um, you know, because if somebody, if somebody offers me something, I am not going to do it. You know, first of all, I don't want to look uncool. I remember once I opened up for, um, probably nobody here remembers this band, but uh, Peter Tosh, uh, one of my favorite groups back in the 70s was Bob Marley and the Whalers. And Peter Tosh was one of the original Whalers. And when Bob Marley died in 81, he, um, he had Peter Tosh. Uh, Peter Tosh went out on tour again. And so I got a chance to open for him. And a friend of mine, another comic, opened up for him in Philadelphia. And I was opening up for him in Washington, D.C. And my friend called me after his, his job and said, listen, don't go backstage. I got a contact tie. I could barely do the show. Well, you know, I always thought I had more stamina or what I was tough or whatever it was. I said, not a problem with me. I can smoke weed. I can, you know, so backstage that, that night, I'd never been around Jamaicans. I'd never been around guys with dreadlocks. I'm nervous. I'm pacing backstage, chain smoking. A couple thousand people out there, all reggae fans. And one of the guys backstage says, hey, funny man, come over here. And I walked over. He handed me a burning baseball bat. I'd never seen a joint this big in my life. And I took two hits and it was Jamaican ganja. I don't even smoke in Jersey shake weed. You know, it was all stems and seeds and stalks. This was Bud, Bud from the motherland. And uh, I took two hits. Next thing I know, I was being introduced like I was underwater. And uh, my friend said, I came out, I laughed for 15 minutes and I left. And the only thing that saved me was the audience was laughing at what they thought I was laughing at. They were so high, so it didn't matter. But I messed up in other ways. I went on stage under acid and I did too much coke and I, I couldn't talk. And I've been on, I, I did a TV show once where I... Uh, came out coked to the gills and and you could see the audience kind of they're kind of looking at what's he saying i mean because i'm i'm a kind of a south jersey mush mash to begin with but if you just put cocaine and speed in me i'm chattering i'm just chattering so i've done all these things and it was it was not working out and i was not happy i got married and and that was just because we were tripping on acid and i proposed when i was on acid i mean you know, she had rainbows shooting out her eyes. What was I supposed to do? I had to propose. So the, I was not paying attention to anything I was doing other than the, everything was kind of going off the rails. The marriage was terrible. My career was floundering. Um, I, I did things, you know, when, when I look back, it was, a lot of it was a lot of alcoholic hubris. A lot of I, I know best for everybody. I, you know, I'm going to tell you how it's going to be. And um, I remember one time I was auditioning for a, just a part in a movie. And it was a, based on a book called The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which at the time I was a fan of and I'd read it. And I read the script and I thought the script was terrible. It was not up to what the book was. So I spent a night drinking and doing cocaine and rewriting the script. They used to send the whole script to you back then when you, back in Los Angeles when you'd audition instead of just the sides, a couple of lines that were your lines. They'd send you the whole script and then say, go on page 25 and you're going to read these lines. So I spent the whole night rewriting the script and I show up the next day and I go, listen, <laughs> I'm doing an audition for a little role. And I go, I've, I read the script. The script's not happening, but I've helped you out here. Rewritten it. Well, the guy who wrote the script sitting in the office when I'm in there, they bum rushed me out of there so fast. My agent fired me before I got home. There was a message on my answering machine. This is how long ago it was, it was pre-cell phones. He said, you're fired, what are you, nuts? 
You people thought I was nuts. There were people who later came and said, you know, I always just thought you were nuts. You know, I mean, I exhibited crazy behavior and I get on why they would think that from time to time. I would do things that were completely, I, I, I look, at the time I was, I was mortified by some of the things I did. And I could not help myself, could not stop drinking and doing drugs. And I tried, I knew, I remember saying, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to not do any more cocaine and I'm just, you know, I'm just smoke weed. I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to do any cocaine, just smoke weed. And of course, I couldn't get off my couch and I'm ordering pizza boxes are piling up in the living room and that's all I'm doing. And that's okay. Okay. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm just going to do cocaine. And of course I'm just grinding my teeth, chain smoking cigarettes. And then I said, well, I'm just, I'm just going to, I'm just going to drink. That's all, you know, go back, just drink alcohol. You know, I'm going, I remember telling my first wife, I'm going down to Barney's Beanery, which is a, a West Hollywood bar and it had pool tables. I'm going down there and just shoot a game of pool. And I woke up driving my car, through the grapevine headed for Bakersfield with two guys in a car who I didn't know who they were. I mean, if you've ever come out of a black, black, black guy like that, I mean, you can't come out of it like shocked. Huh? <laughs> who are you guys? You got to come out and go, hey, and I say where we're going. And apparently uh, we were going to Bakersfield to get cocaine because Los Angeles was out. <laughs> I mean, it's insane. I would, because that's how an alcoholic is though. I mean, when they say that alcoholics, you have no willpower, addicts, you have no willpower. We have tremendous willpower to get the drug when we want the drug, whatever it is. I'm driving two guys I didn't know to Bakersfield. I show up at a drug dealer's house who I just, I'd been up there performing the weekend before, so I'd spend the weekend hanging out with his drug dealer. So my little alcoholic drug addict mind remembered where the guy lived in Bakersfield, and I drove there at three in the morning, and I tell you something, if you haven't experienced this yet, try to put this in your mind. Drug dealers who you just met don't want to see you come to their house unannounced. And especially with two guys sitting outside in a car who they've never seen before. This guy showed up at the front door with a gun in his hand. And I went to the back door. I had to get those drugs to get home. I mean, it's just, that's how desperate I was. I knew I was just in trouble. And there was nothing. I was rotating bald tires on a car. car. That's all I was doing. I was just rotating bald tires on a car. No matter how I worked it, no weed, just drink, no cocaine, just weed. No matter how I did it, it was just, it was not working. And I don't have any kind of prejudice against them. I mean, I, opiates, I did them when I needed them or had them. I mean, my problem with quaaludes is it just made me a piece of luggage. I didn't like the opiates. I didn't like what it did to me. I didn't like to be stationary. I had to go because I was so jumping out of my skin. And I don't, you know, I don't have any, they'll all get you. If you're an alcoholic or a or drug addict, they'll, any drug will get you. I mean, cocaine may be a cobra, but marijuana is a python. It will slowly squeeze your life out of you. You'll wake up at 50 one day going, what? Where, where did it all go? So it's all the same. You know, you may crash faster, but it all, it all to me, it all ends has the same result. And of course, look, I I know young people who, I know, I, I, I work with young guys who, who, who um, they're helping me stay sober and I'm helping them stay sober and clean. And the fentanyl is a whole nother thing that I didn't have to deal with. I didn't deal with heroin, but not fentanyl. That's that's something off the chart that I'm, you know, I have no idea how, how I know how dangerous it is, but I have no idea. I've never dealt with any of that stuff. There's a lot of things. Look, I used to think when um, when ecstasy came along, I was just sober. I just gotten sober, and uh, <laughs> I was like ecstasy. I never did that. And then it turned out I had done it. It was called MDMA. That's what it was back in the seventies. It's the same thing. They just tweaked the formula a little bit to keep it outside the federal statutes. Uh, if actually uh, ecstasy was actually invented by the Germans in World War One, they were looking for some sort of amphetamine to give their troops that wouldn't be so harsh. They grind their teeth down to sawdust. But then the troops were humping each other and playing oompa music all night long. So you know the the Germans don't like to run a war that way. So they they dropped the ecstasy and went right back to schnapps and bayonets. So that's how that's the history of ecstasy. If you want to know, nothing's new really. There's not a lot new. Um, some of the synthetic drugs, I'm, I know there must be something, but, um, uh, for me, there's nothing, I mean, when I got sober, I remember 
uh, Zima came out, like a drink called Zima. <laughs> and somebody goes, wow, I never tried Zima. I go, really? You never tried alcohol? It's just another form of alcohol. I mean, I, I, I was done. I was done. A friend of mine who, who was my Eskimo, and that Eskimo is the, is the person who, who helped bring you into sobriety, helps bring me to a place where I could get sober, helps help me. He said uh, he saw me getting kicked out of a post office in the daytime in West Hollywood for being drunk and disorderly, causing a scene in a post office in the daytime drunk. There's no cool drunks left. <laughs> There's nothing, I'm, I'm not rock and roll and getting kicked out of a post office for being drunk in the daytime. I have no idea what was the problem, whether they weren't giving me the proper roll of stamps that I wanted or asked, I have no idea what, what it was, but there's nothing cool left. And I was, you know, when I, when I first got sober, when I first quit, and I'd hear people talk about their experiences and people talk about drinking in the morning before they went to work. And I thought, well, I didn't drink in the morning. I, I, I didn't do that. I got that going for me. Didn't drink in the morning. <laughs> and then, and then as I, I got a little more clarity with my sobriety rise. Well, you weren't getting up till two in the afternoon. That was your morning. I was drinking. I just changed the, the dial around a bit. I could not leave the house without drinking. And that was really, I mean, I, like I said, I used to pride myself on going on stage clean and not having, you know, maybe hung over, but, but not being drunk and not being actively high when I went to do what I did. But I wasn't getting out of the house to go down to the club to perform until I had a couple of drinks. I was just try I had to get the shakes gone and I had to try to get some bravery. I mean, we used to laugh at you, call it liquid courage. Give me some of this liquid courage. And it truly was that for me. I was so frightened. And again, I was, it, things were closing in on me. You know, I was having night sweats and I was waking up um, with bodily discharges that I shouldn't have been having. I was really, really in trouble before I, somebody said, hey, there's a way out. You know, I can help you, take you to a place. And then this is 1985. So rehabs weren't as clear. They weren't as present. They weren't as ubiquitous. And the knowledge of them weren't, you know, I didn't have that, oh, yeah, I'll just go to rehab. I didn't even know how I could do it. You know, I didn't think I had the money. My uh, comedic friend, Sam Kennison, when, when it came to his time, he was another comic. And when he, the time to get his, to get sober, they were, you know, rehabs were much more prevalent. And somebody said, he said, well, how much is rehab? And they said, well, rehab's 17000 Sam. He said, if I have $17,000, I'm not ready for rehab. I got some moves left. You know, got some moves left. That's the whole thing. I had no moves left. I was out of Mickey Mouse moves. And I was willing. Absolutely willing to do whatever you said to try to get sober. I was so desperate. Because I knew I was in trouble. I knew it. I knew it. I remember some people along the way. You know, people along the way all through my my drinking career for 20 years 20 years from 12 to 32 people would say from time to time you know you kind of have a problem with alcohol you know you're not you're not a good guy when you drink i would just find new people to talk to i was not going to be insulted like that <laughs> you're not going to stop my partying i'm a free free human being you know and uh if they tell me no you know i, I remember somebody saying you know geez don't bring out the cocaine he's here I mean, I was slippery, slippery. You know, people would go, this happened more than once. We'd be partying and the host, they'd go, well, look at that, man. We got we almost got an eight ball for tomorrow. We, we'll just put that over here on the shelf. And they're, good night, everybody. And I'm like, good night, good night. Of course, they wake up in the morning, it's all gone. You know, I was slippery. It was always, you know, the people, and I, I knew, I knew, you know, I was, I was, I was cutting off relationships and I was and the world was getting small my world was getting really small and I wasn't getting the work that I got earlier in my career you know when I was bowling through things and huh. so I was willing to do whatever they said to, to, to try to end this thing you know and um, boy I wish I could have say I, I you know when I quit drinking and, and doing drugs I became a nice guy immediately you know my I did a lot of acting, you know, I would, I would act, um, uh, I, w I would want you to like me so that I wouldn't fear you so much. 
I know that's kind of a weird thing, but that was it. You know, I did things to try to get you to like me so then I wouldn't be afraid of you. And that was a weird equation. But when I got sober, I, I didn't have that old standby, you know, and, and I was hanging out with people who were, who were being sober. And that helped a lot. But I had a lot of anger, a lot of anger. I mean, you took away my best friend. I never, never considered getting sober until, you know, a few months before I did get sober. It's not like I, I knew I had a problem. I tried so many things to adjust that problem. You know, I tried to drink like a, a regular person. I thought my drink. I tried to do drugs like a regular person might do drugs. I don't know what that would be, you know. But I tried to, you know. I mean, I I'd, I'd hear people talk about it, like, well, I I only smoke weed on the weekends, you know. And I go, really? What do you do the other five days? I mean, you know. So, but I tried all that. But when I got sober, I was angry. I got in I got in fist fights when I was sober. And they're much different than when you're drinking. I can tell you that right now. They, you tend to feel the pain right away. It's not like you wake up the next day and go, oh, geez, what happened there? You know, it's, it's, it, they tend to be shorter. I mean, I just was angry, really angry. I mean, I, I, I'm not proud of this. I'm just going to tell you wh where I was. I, I drove around with batteries in my car, not, not the car battery that, that gets the car started. You know, like D cell batteries that you put in a, boom box or something like that well a double a badge i put them in my glove box as ammunition and if somebody drove in a way that didn't suit me i tossed batteries at them i mean i i was insane i was insane but i i just kept going doing the things that people suggested to do to try to stay sober and not drink a day at a time and not do drugs a day at a time and i started getting a little better i started liking myself better you know when i I used to have these styptic pencils around. Now, maybe they're old school, but when you'd cut yourself shaving, they had these pencils that they were, they would really burn when you put them on. But they would they would stop the bleeding because if you a razor cut is really you know it bleeds a lot. I used to have or I'd walk out with little toilet papers on my face. I used to cut myself shaving so much, and I realized when I got sober, the reason I was cutting myself shaving so much was I wasn't looking at myself in the mirror when I was shaving. I could not stand to look at myself in the mirror. And when I got sober, I never used those styptic pencils again. I never walked out of the house with five little tissues paper on, stenching the blood in my face. I didn't have that problem anymore. There were little things along the way that were showing me I was on the right path. I started becoming employable. I, I was I would show up when I said I'd show up. I'd do the job. I wasn't causing trouble with the other people I was working with. And, um, and I started getting effective at what I was doing. And I started getting success, and I liked that, and I liked the way I was feeling about myself. I cleaned things up. I cleaned things up with people, you know. Not, not just saying I'm sorry. I used to say I was sorry all the time. I was just sorry. It was like the the full statement was sorry. I'm going to do it again sometime. I'll tell you I'm sorry next time. But I'm saying I'm sorry this time. But I'm going to do it again, and then I'll say I'm sorry again. I mean, I started correcting my behavior. I started watching people. <clears throat> you know, I used to emulate all the people who were. Pirates, you know, that's what I liked. I like pirates. I like people who took shortcuts, you know. What somebody once told me a couple of years ago in my sobriety, you know, shortcut is the fastest way to the end of the line. You know, I like that. I started going to the, you know, walking into a place and saying, I'm going to do it the right way. I'm going to do it the way people are doing it. And, and follow the people who seem to be and, and I was watching people. Of course, I still watch people carefully. I was watching the people who, who were walking the talk and who were, who were happy with themselves and people around them are happy with them. And they had relationships that mattered. And I started modeling my behavior after them, you know, working on these character defects, which I had a lot of, you know, and, and paying attention to them. You know, I used to, when I first got sober, I used to blame or my my addiction or my alcoholism. Well, I, I do that because I'm an alcoholic. It's not true. Until because I'm an asshole. You know, I don't I don't cut in front of li in line because I'm an alcoholic. The only thing I do as an alcoholic is I drink too much. But when I cut in front of the line, I'm being an asshole, not an alcoholic. So I, people help me correct this and gently showed me a way of going, a different way of going, and it changed everything in my life. My my career, I became, like I said, much more effective. I, I always wanted to be a writer. 
always want to be a writer, but I couldn't sit down long enough to, to actually do it. And I'm a writer now. I, I write and I, I love writing. And I've made money right now. I retired from the Writers Guild of America with a pension. <laughs> I'm a writer. That's what I wanted to be, not not just a monkey on the stage, which I, I still like doing that too. I'll be honest with you. I love to hear a room full of people laughing. It means they're all happy. I'm connected to them, but I have connections off stage now that I never thought I was possible for me. No, I, I'm not. I'm not thinking that everything's cured. I'm not cured. A day at a time. I, these concepts that I got, that a day at a time, and no matter what, I don't drink or do drugs no matter what, and a day at a time I stay clean. And I hang around with people who are good people. I don't hang around with those pirates anymore. I don't want, there's nothing through it. Look, I know I'm older. <laughs> you, go like, who, you know, there's a Chris Rock joke, you know, about the old guy in a bar. He's not too old, just too old to be in the bar. You know, I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be that fool. I want, I want to be someone that people can, can trust and, and depend upon and that people, and they do, and they do. And I've helped people. I love helping people. My, my whole aim every day, every day I wake up, first thing I do is get on the floor and I pray. Don't ask me who I pray to. I pray to God. I have no idea who or what this God is. You know, you can't expect me to explain the creator of the universe I can't even explain how you pour Kleenex out. Another one pops out right behind it. So I pray to this God of my misunderstanding. And I don't know if God's listening or paying attention or anything, but it makes me feel better. And I start my day asking humbly for help staying sober today and to help another person stay sober. And I call up people and they call me up and we help each other. And I have so much more time. And I remember one time I, you know, it's just people go, like, you spend so much time on this sobriety thing. You know, what do you, what do you have time? To, I have so much more time today to do things. It's it's not even funny. It, and, and I'm more effective because I'm clear. I'm not thinking, my head is not crowded with all the things that, oh, geez, I can't see this person. Don't go over here because they might be there. Oh, well, I, I, I don't want them to see me. Oh, geez, can't go down there anymore. Oh, geez. What did I do there? I gotta, I can't, none of those thoughts are in my head anymore. I make little mistakes. I clean them up fast and I move on. I'm not, my head is not overflowing like a, my head used to be a rat nest. My head used to be just like tunnels up there, a little vermin going around and, and just thoughts that were just distractions, distractions, distractions from the creative process, distractions from being able to be effective in what I want to do. I don't have that anymore. I can't even tell you. You know, when I first got drunk for freedom, I wanted freedom from my fear. That's all I wanted. When it worked, man, I was like, this is it. I have found the magic elixir. And then, of course, that turned into a prison. It turned into a prison. I didn't even realize it. And then when I got out with sobriety, I'm free. Again, I am free. I am never going back to that prison. Never. This is it for me. Day at a time. I don't get hung up about it. You ask me what you, <laughs> my my brain will still go. You mean I can't have a beer in ten years? Ten years from now, come on, be seventy nine years old. What kind of damage can you do then? Well, I ain't got to worry about that ten years from now. I'm just worried about today. I keep it in today. I make plans for the future. I work for things for the future. I still have that. My parents are still alive. I love hanging out with them. My dad and I, I can give a whole story about that. He got sober too. I love this man. He makes me laugh. I gave you the stories. My dad and I had fist fights. I shot at him with a gun. We were hunting and I saw an opportunity. He never took me hunting again. Took my brothers, wouldn't take me. I don't blame him. You know, and then I got sober and he got sober. We made amends to each other. We cleaned up all of our wreckage. And uh, it's a beautiful relationship. You know, my friends when I was young, my friends used to say, you know, your dad's really funny. I said, not to me, he's not. And he is to me now. And these are the things I never saw coming. When I quit drinking and doing drugs, if you'd asked me 37 years ago, May 12th, 37 years ago, one day sobriety, you and your dad are going to get along well. Get out of here. Look, I'm just trying not to drink and do drugs right now. That's all I'm trying to do. Yeah, but you and your dad, you know, a few years from now, you guys are going to get along great. <laughs> My dream was to make enough money to buy a car and a, a truck, buy a pickup truck with a boat behind it and drive it through his front door of his house and tossing the keys. That was my idea of, of paying him back. <laughs> well, it's a whole different thing now, you know, a whole different thing. I, 
I, I know I'm lucky. I am lucky. I'm great, grateful. I never even thought that word. I didn't like that word when people would say, oh, I'm grateful. <laughs> For what, man? <laughs> I hated it when people said it. And I'm one of those people now. I'm grateful. I am truly grateful. And I don't know where I am on this time thing here. <laughs> I get carried away. But uh, I don't know who's listening or who's watching. But if you think you got a problem with alcohol and drugs, get help. There's so much help out there. You don't have to do this alone. You don't have to live with this in your head. You don't have to kill yourself. I've lost friends. My best friends, you know, there's five guys that drank that first night, me in 1965. Three of us were alcoholic. Two of them got sober along with me. One, I helped 12 step. He was a scientist down in, in Huntsville, Alabama. Went to MIT, helped set trajectories for space shuttles. And was living in a trailer out in the woods. And uh, he got sober, then he went out and drank again and died. I've lost some people I really care about, really care about. And it broke my heart. And it breaks my heart whenever I see somebody die of this disease, this affliction. But on the other hand, when I'm seeing somebody and the lights come on in sobriety, and I see them go, I get it, and they want it, it's the greatest thing in the world. It's the greatest thing in the world. And you have that for yourself. You, you, you feel that yourself, and you go, Oh yeah, that's what he's talking about. And then one day you'll go to be looking at some other person, you'll see lights come on in their eyes, you go, Oh yeah, I love that feeling. These are things that I never thought I'd be one of these people. They go like I, I really am satisfied, happy, satisfied. It's things I still want to do and I, I love doing what I'm doing, but I'm, there's nothing I need more than I have. <laughs> that's not an alcoholic like me to say that. <laughs> Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Rich. It was uh, it was great. We got a couple of minutes. We have a couple of questions. Um, do you think your sense of humor, your ability uh, to perform, stems from being the child of an alcoholic and trying to keep the peace in your family? Yeah, absolutely. When I go down and visit my parents, still sometimes you know I find myself in that role. My job was to make my mom laugh and was to keep my dad off her in a way. So uh, I was very much into that role and. Um, yeah, and, and when I was growing up in our house, it was currency, you know, laughter was, you know, nobody was getting hit, nobody was getting yelled at when there was laughter in the house, whether it was on television or not. So laughter was always valued. My dad loved it. He loved, he went out and saw comedians and nightclubs and he, he had all these comedy albums that I listened to when I was a kid. So yeah, it was big in my house and it was definitely my role to make my mom laugh. She was very depressed too. Now that you're sober, do you still struggle with compulsive or excessive tendencies in other areas? <laughs> when, when I first found eBay a few years ago, I mean, this is, I don't know what it was. It was like, um, yeah, about 15, 16 years ago. I once bought four motorcycles in a week. I won four motorcycle auctions in a week. Now, if you know anything about motorcycles, you generally can only ride one at a time. It's not that I was rich or anything. I bought one Harley with a sidecar up in Colorado, two of them in Southern California, and one of them in Oregon. I, I, I mean, I wasn't even paying attention. I was lucky there were none in New Jersey. I had to go back there. I had to go to Colorado and drive this one back. I bought four. I mean, I could not stop. It was so obsessive and compulsive with uh, you know bidding on, on eBay. I got to win, and I'd be checking and checking. It was a, it was a distraction. Totally distraction. You know, Facebook can be like that. You know, I mean, that I had to, I, I went to Facebook anonymous. I got, I got a sponsor. I got, I got a, I got somebody who uh, helped, helped me detox and get off it so I could get work done because I, I would spend all my time on that, you know, having battles. Nobody, nobody's ever going to end their life with a social media regret. You know, oh, if I want more, one more Twitter battle, if I had one more Twitter battle, oh, if I just won. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm compulsive. Is that the answer? <laughs> Here's another question. <clears throat> How long did it take for the anger to go away that came after your sobriety began? It took a long time. It took, I got better and better, but it never truly went away. You know, that's where my fear, um, I guess people exhibit fear in different ways, but when I fear, you know, uh, there was an old, a guy who I met, he was an old Boston gangster, a counterfeiter named Leo. And Leo would say, whenever I get upset, I always wonder what it is that little Leo is not getting that he wants, you know, and that's it. You know, whenever I feel like I'm not getting the attention I want or the approval I want, 
I started getting afraid I'm never going to get it. And then I started getting angry. And then I start getting grievances. And then I start resentments and resentments. So, you know, they're, they're, they're luxury, dubious luxury of other men and women. I don't have that luxury. Resentments will kill me. And I have to just clear it out. I'm just constantly working on it. I'm constantly calibrating myself. You know, not all the time, but I still have that anger. This is the <clears throat> this is the last question. So did you ever receive treatment for the dissociative identity disorder? Yeah, I had a, a lot of treatments I had. I, you know, uh, this is just my story, and I have no opinion about anybody else. But the bottom line was I was... I went to different people, um, psychiatrists. They thought I was, they said, you have all the, the, the few people, uh, professionals said, you, you were probably sexually abused. I said, I have no memories of it. And they said, well, um, you have all the, the symptoms of somebody who's been sexually abused. I said, none. I went through uh, hypnosis on sodium pentothal. I went to a person who was an expert in violence. They eventually ended up with this person who said, um, what it is is the, the level of violence that you got when you were young um, it, it, it's the same, it's the same. These people are thinking that it's sexual abuse, but the symptoms are the same for someone such as yourself who suffered the kind of trauma you did. So, um, they, they said, you know, there were people who thought I was going to be on medication the rest of my life. I don't take any medication today. I exercise regularly, meditation, yoga. I run, I do a lot of things. I don't take any medications. I don't have any opinion about people who do take medications. I'm just telling you myself, I spent 13 days in a, this is sobriety. At 25 years sober, I spent 13 days in UCLA psych unit uh, based upon a, a, a um, suicidal depression that lasts for months. Couldn't get out of bed, couldn't get out. And then I met somebody who, my only solution is a spiritual solution. I found somebody who helped me in a spiritual way and, and brought me to another place. And I had to find a spiritual solution. I will not find, I will not find a, any other kind of help that really matters to what I'm doing. So that's, yeah, that's it. I mean, I don't take any medication. I don't, I don't have, I have very seldom I get a panic attack. It's very brief, it's short. They're all manageable. And, um, but I never, I never think I'm gonna be cured, cured. But the, the social disorder thing, I sort of outgrew. And um, the one psychiatrist said that's, very typical. You're not going to have that because you're no longer in that kind of trauma. Once I got out of the household, uh, once I became a teenager and could fend off and fight myself, then uh, I was no longer being victimized by that kind of violence. And so I outgrew the, the social disorder, but the, um, you know, the, the, the vapors remain. <laughs> Rich, thank you so much. You did great tonight. Um, thanks everyone who helped put this together. Uh, if you're watching out there, I'd like to invite you back next Thursday for recording artist Astrew Sierra and Sydney Bullens. Come back next Thursday at seven o'clock. I'll see you then. Thanks again, Rich. Thank you, Casey. Thank you. Thank you, the lady up there who's smiling. Thank you.